Hey, this is Anthony Davis with Shapeshift Wellness. And in today's video, we're talking about the joint by joint approach. Uh, that's going to be Gray Cook. So look them up if you want the source of the information. So we're looking at the joint by joint approach, which is a way of classifying joints based on their primary function being either stability or mobility. So we're trying to say this is a mobility joint, but this other joint is a stability joint. Uh, we're going to explore the potential usefulness of this approach and and the potential downsides or limitations uh, or criticisms of this approach. Uh, and I will give several examples of movements uh, that we can try to apply this to at the end of the video. So let's check it out. Okay, so we're looking at the joint by joint approach. Again, right here is the citation for the book. This is the book that you're going to want to look for, uh, Gray Cook movement. So he's uh, the guy who came up with the functional movement systems and uh, a lot of the movement screens that people use today. So if you want to look deeper into the origins of this joint by joint approach, then you're going to want to look at that book. This is meant to be an overview. Uh, in today's episode, we're talking about how we can generally look at this approach, uh, generally understand uh, stability versus mobility joints. Uh, and then we're going to criticize it a little bit. If you want a deep dive, please go to the original source. Okay, so the joint by joint approach is a way of essentially classifying joints um, based on what in this author's opinion is the primary function of a joint. So he's basically tried to simplify things to the point of saying, well, the knee, the knee is a stability joint versus the ankle where the ankle is a mobility joint. And what you'll see is there's a pattern where it alternates. So we start with a mobility joint and then a stability joint and then a mobility joint and then a stability, then mobility, stability, blah, blah, blah. So essentially one area of the body needs to be able to brace so that we can transfer forces. Uh, we can transfer a load through that area of the body. And then the next chain, so to speak, on the link is a uh, an area that needs to be able to move to accomplish motion and movement and you know athletic endeavors, whatever your thing is, yoga, uh, lifting weights, it doesn't matter. So this is the general approach. And we can try to understand it. Again, we will criticize it at the uh, as we get into the meat of the video. But first, I want you to get the idea before I criticize it. So a common example is the, the, the legs. So let's say that we had a person squatting and if they were squatting, um, well, if according to this approach, the knee is a stability joint, the hip is a mobility joint and the ankle is a mobility joint. Meaning that um, if we are having a difficult time moving into a deep squat, then where would a person lack mobility and where might we want to improve our mobility in order to get into the position well according to this theory we're going to look at the hip and the ankle and we're going to ignore the knee that the knee is sort of a passenger it's stuck in between two problem children the hip and the ankle and if either of those is lacking mobility then the knee which is a stability joint has to do something that it is not designed to do, which is to provide mobility. And since it is a stability joint, if you force it to provide mobility that the hip or the ankle should have provided, then you might develop problems with the knee later on. This is the theory. So they would say, well, if they are having a difficult time squatting, let's look at the hip and ankle mobility. It's a good first low hanging fruit type of guess. Um, another one is the lumbar spine. So we have the lumbar spine as a stability joint. And um, we see that, you know, in every sport imaginable, people are telling you to tighten up your belly, suck your navel to your spine. In yoga, we're always being told that navel to the spine. Um, if you're doing planks or crunches or lifting weights, everybody's telling you to brace your core. There is a time and a place to brace your core, and there is a time and a place that the core needs to move. So this is where the uh, theory of joint by joint needs more nuance. So let's let's get to that in a moment. So 
we're doing a movement experiment. So the, the way that I think that the joint by joint approach can be useful is again as low hanging fruit. If we are working with a person and we're trying to teach them movement and they're having a hard time, we might consult the chart and we might say, oh, they're having a difficult time with downward facing dog. They're having a difficult time getting into this position. Well, what joints really need to be able to do it? Are they having a difficult time because they feel they're unstable? If so, maybe we work on scapula thoracic stuff. We work on strengthening serratus anterior. We work on, uh, you know, people get obsessed with the uh, scapula if they're winging, your shoulder blades winging. And so you might look at that and say, oh, the scapula, which is supposed to be a stability joint, is winging. And therefore, it is clearly not displaying characteristics of stability. So let's give it more stability. That's the idea. And then, oh, well, they're lacking mobility. They feel tight when they're uh, reaching overhead. So let's improve the glenohumeral mobility because the shoulder joint needs to be mobile, right? It's the most mobile joint in your body. It makes sense on a very, very surface level, a very, very simplistic level. This joint by joint approach can be a quick and easy way of making your guesses perhaps slightly more accurate for a person. But again, it breaks down because, well, let's say you try that. Let's say you had, and there are there um, is actually a lot of research on trying to quote unquote correct a person's uh, scapular winging and showing that it's not only very, very difficult to do so, but even if they do so, it doesn't necessarily improve their uh, pain. So interesting stuff, but that's another video. So the point is that if we're looking at a movement experiment, uh, we need to be willing to ignore the models, ignore all of that stuff and look at a human being in front of us and try things even if they don't make sense according to our dogmatic models. So to illustrate the point, I can say, you know, why is it so hard to balance rocks? Right? If you've ever tried to balance rocks like you see in this picture here, it is outrageously difficult to balance a rock. And why is that? Well, they can't move. It, it, the only property that you can rely on in order to accomplish your goal with balancing rocks on top of each other is that you need to have stability. You don't want any mobility because if there's any mobility in the, uh, let's call them joints, like right here and right here and right here, let's call these joints. If there's any mobility in those areas, then the whole tower tumbles, right? All the rocks will fall. So you, you need all of this to be 100% stable and 0% mobile or your goal fails. Now, if you tried to classify a, a human body based on, you know, an area needing stability, well, that really ignores the fact that it needs to be mobile as well. Right. So it, I liked this picture. I was uh, looking for royalty free <laughs> uh, images of balance. And uh, this image came up and I thought this was kind of cool because, you know, she's sitting here in this uh, sling and this uh, aerial sort of hammock. And, you know, you can imagine that this would be, um, you know, a little tricky to get used to the balance at first. You know, she's going to have to kind of wobble over in this direction and then immediately correct herself and kind of wobble in this direction. So she's going to be wobbling from side to side a little bit, but her corrections will become like just a little like, you know, just like a little. And then eventually you kind of get it and you can remain stable. So she's trying to achieve stability. But the only, and this is key, so if you've ignored me for a second or you zoned out, pay attention. The only reason she's able to balance there and achieve her goal of stability in this position, and the reason why it's so much easier for a human to balance than it is to balance rocks, is because the human can move. So if the human tries to aim for stability and then overshoots it a little bit, they don't fall, they just self-correct they have mobility too, right? And this would be a property that every single joint in your body needs. Every joint in your body needs some amount of stability and some amount of mobility. And it depends on your goals. So if we had a lifter, um, 
you know, somebody who's lifting really, really heavy weights, or imagine that this person was a football lineman, then this person would be uh, responsible for literally crushing other humans with their own body. <laughs> so their spine, let's take the lumbar spine for uh, as an example in here, and their spine is, according to the joint by joint approach, a stability segment. And well, yeah, for a linebacker, they need their spine to be incredibly stable because, again, they're crushing other human beings with their own body. But let's say that you had a gymnast. Do they need their lumbar spine to be stable? It, would you classify it as a stability area? Uh, it kind of seems silly to me because the gymnast needs so much more mobility, even in their lumbar spine, compared to a linebacker, that... It's more useful in my mind to think about the task rather than try to simplify things down to, well, the lumbar you know, region is always stability and the thoracic is always mobility. I want to make sure that the dancer can move and accomplish their task. So I might think more task specific rather than joint specific. Okay, this is again where this idea starts to break down and we need to be able to infuse some nuance. So um, in this example, though, I, I actually didn't put this picture in there for that reason. I put it in for another reason to give us an example of um, a uh, movement, an exercise that we can use to uh, explore the joint by joint theory. So how I might use it. Let's say that this person's trying to do a squat and they're having a difficult time getting down. They're, they're, they can't get deep down into the squat. Well, I know that in order to achieve deep, deep hip flexion and get the butt down to the ground, that the hips need to be extremely mobile so that we can drive the knees out. Um, and the reason we need to do that is literally just so that we can uh, clear room for the torso to get down to the ground. So if we're trying to do that, uh, and then we need ankles to be mobile so that the knees can drive forward. Um, and again, this is just a matter of being able to achieve the task. So I might look at this person and say, all right, they're having a hard time. Well, let's look at each joint and see if these joints are mobile or not. And I'm not going to look at the knee joint for mobility because it doesn't necessarily need it. It's not the, the joint that provides mobility in a squat. The hip joint and the ankle joint are going to be larger contributors to uh, mobility. And I might look at the lumbar spine and I might see that the person is capable of bracing, uh, not because bracing is the end all be all, but because it might be low hanging fruit that provides them a little bit more stability to lift a little bit more weight if, they're, uh, if that's their goal. However, if it doesn't work, I'm willing to try completely different things. I'm willing to completely abandon the idea of a mobility and a stability joint because this is a made up concept that is meant to try to give you a better first guess. Um, but it should not be your only guess and your only tool. Um, another example here is, you know, if you're a fighter and let's say punching, you know, there's a moment that you do need to brace your core where the lumbar spine, for example, needs to be stable. And according to the joint by joint theory, that's what it is. It's a stability joint. But also we are a tensegrity structure. Our anatomy is such that we can whip around. And if you're able to successfully whip that involves rotation. And yes, it involves a little bit of rotation and movement and lateral flexion uh, of the lumbar spine. Not a lot. It's not a very good area for creating mobility because of the anatomy, but it still needs some mobility in order to create a whip right? It needs to be able to transfer loads. So again, this is where, you know, it's a toss up of like, well, okay, it makes sense that we need to transfer a load through the lumbar spine. Therefore it's a stability joint. 
but we need to also be able to, you know, uh, rotate and move and have segmental mobility. So we have better proprioception. So we move better in general. Uh, so we have a, a better representation of that area to our brain. There's a lot of other, you know, fun things that you can explore if you want to just geek out about why we need mobility in all areas and stability in all areas. But uh, the point is don't be dogmatic. So this is a picture of me and my dog. And I put it here to remind me to remind you to not be dogmatic. Also, it's just a good excuse to earn a little bit of free points with puppy pictures. So that's my puppy and his name is Aries and he's a little guy, doesn't look like it, but he's a little guy and you should like this video for him because of, because I mean, look at him, look at him, look at him. Anyway, subscribe to my channel and I'll see you in the next episode.